but it has to be just the peak spitting pits and I'll still arm and arm <laughs> if it's doing it in Ballina but so we're down here in um in Ballina. The area's had five attacks in the last four months. Um, we've decided we want to talk to a few people in the area and get their perspectives as to why these attacks may have happened, how those instances have affected the local community and what's going to get done to help put people at ease in the area. I'm Adam Melling from uh, Lennox Head. I've been on the CT now for about five years. At the start of the year there was that fatal attack in Ballina and that sort of caught everyone a bit by surprise. And but just yesterday the waves were pumping and we went in there and it was just me and a mate, no one was ours, like there's no way. It's a pretty hard debate, you know, all these people, some want to kill them, some want to put baits, some want to put nets, you know, and um, we're in their territory but a lot of people's livelihood come from the ocean as well, which is like my job, it's fishermen's jobs. So we're now going to go see the mayor in Ballina. Um, we're going to talk to him about um, what mitigation strategies he's trying to put in place now um, to safeguard the local community. The best thing that we have is we have water assets and we have air assets and we'll use those to make it safe. Now the long term we know that's not sustainable um, and there might be some other mitigation measures but because it, this is an Australia wide problem. Um, it needs a, a, someone to stand back and, and look at the research and say, what can we do in Australia? We're home of great whites. What are they doing in South Africa? What are they doing in Florida? What are they doing in other places that have the sharks? And, and um, you know, let's do something to, you know, to protect the sharks but keep them away from humans. We're all the year round. We're here from five o'clock to all, all day. But most mornings there used to always be people surfing just on daylight. The most dangerous period you could surf. They'd head down there at the boards. Not happening now. A person from the public came up and they just yelled into the room, shark attack. Paramedic that did come, mm. but they had only been carrying the blood product for three days, mm. which is full blood. Yeah. And I think, yeah. That's what, what was a huge factor. In That's it. what saved him. I mean, it's, yeah, it's really sad. There's no way in the world you'd get anybody out there today, I don't think. I don't think you'd go out, would you? No. no. Would you? Uh -uh. So we've just come to Lennox and seen some people that have just come in from the surf. Let's see if they've been spooked by the sharks. Yeah, I was like sitting on the lineup and then there came a fin. And I've seen like a lot of dolphins, but uh, the dolphins. Yeah, dolphins go like they go up and then they go down. And there's usually more than one. They tried to tell me that come, there's come a shark. <laughs> I never think about it when I'm in the water. I never think about it. But <laughs> I think today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After, I think like, about it a little because it was that. so close. <laughs> yeah. Many of the pro fishers didn't want to speak to us. We found a couple that do want to voice their opinion. Yeah, I've just seen like a dramatic increase in like shark population and stuff like that at the moment, especially with a lot of bait fish moving in close, whales migrating north. And but you can see the bites out yeah, of the side, so while the shark's been hooked up, other sharks themselves have come and, come and had a go at it. And so that head alone weighed, I think, eight kilos. So we're off to go see Dr. Danny Boucher at Southern Cross Uni now. Um, we want to get someone who's got some facts and some scientific research behind him to see what's actually happening in the area. As a, as a marine biologist, I see the fact that we've got lots of sharks as, a, as actually a good thing for the environment. It's, it's an indication that the environment is productive. Um, it means there's lots of fish, um, lots of dolphins, and that's the, the consequence of that is the top predators are being supported by that food web. Yeah, so with Great Whites and, and their movements, we've been doing tracking programs now for quite a number of years. And the problem with Great Whites is there's not so many of them. You need a lot of money just to put one tag on one shark. Those tags tend to just have a limited battery life. So you get a little bit of information on what that shark's doing, but you don't get information on what that shark does over, say, a five-year period. It's, it's Apache sort of thing, it's, it's not a regular thing, you, you can't say there is a shark season here, 
it can happen at different times of the year. Um, and, you know, I guess we tend to focus on those times when there's a cluster of incidents. We forget um, the early 2000s, there was a period of seven years where there was no incident reported. Um, so, you know, that doesn't make the news. Seven years with nothing happening. <laughs> a year ago, I wasn't even thinking about it. I'd surf till dark, pitch black around the cove, not even care. Yeah, oh, as soon as there's people out there, I only surf when it's crowded. Some nights, within like two seconds, shark, straight on. Yeah. And it's just like, you see the fin come up, and, yeah. and then the next morning, you know, the surf's pumping. I don't know. I really don't know. I just need time to... No sharks. That's all I want. Like, I don't care what scientists do. Yeah. Uh, everyone's on edge, pretty much. Pretty um, freaky times. But uh, two days this week, you know, people chased in. And... One of the mitigation techniques has been aerial patrols. So we went and spoke to the guy who's been the eyes in the sky. My name's Tim Latimer. I'm uh, half owner and chief pilot of Air TNG Helicopter Services at Ballina. On 80% of our flights, we would see a, a shark of some form whether they're small sharks or, uh, or medium-sized sharks. And over the years, I've, I've come to believe that we're not on the menu as a general rule. We see them interacting close to people uh, quite often. I, I have watched a shark at the, uh, at the Lennox Point um, stalk a surfer in a lineup of about 20, and it's approached that surfer probably five times and picked him as he's moved through, he's caught a wave and then come back into the lineup in a different position. And each time it's picked him and yet it, it Stop before it would bite him. You can't figure it out? Shark bite? Yeah. It's a shark bite. It's only a little yeah. one. Yeah, you don't go two days without them, eh? Friday, was it Friday time? We were sitting down here and that big one was just there? Yeah, yeah. Like 50 metres yeah. away? Yeah, so the media portrays the sharks as a villain and I guess you would expect that the mainstream media would do that because they need to sell a product and and drama cells. There was actually just a, a recent study that was released that um, they realized that the population estimates on the east coast of Australia are actually lower than what they expected them to be. The great whites need to be protected because they're the top predator and if you wipe out the top predator then it has a domino effect across the food chain. But so for years I've only seen maybe one or two sharks, little ones. Since February there have been three significant attacks in the region, one which was fatal. Meanwhile, two surfers remain recovering in hospital following their attacks. The increased media attention, sightings and stories of close encounters have left many in the community on edge. So I think, yes, yeah, psychologically we've got two things happening. The danger is unseen, we, you know, we don't see it coming up out of the depths. Um, and the other one is, I suppose, we are not used to being prey. There is that deep-seated fear that it's not just trying to kill us, it's trying to eat us. And I think there's something psychological about that. And, um, I don't think it's a case of they mistake us for their food. I think they're just interested. Is it something to eat? And I think part of the luck of the draw is how long's it been since they've had a meal? They don't eat all the time. They, they can go long periods without a meal. If they've just eaten, they might give it a bump and see if it's an easy meal, if it puts up a fight, if it doesn't taste all that good, gets a mouthful of fiberglass, you know, and we'll leave that alone. If they're really hungry and it's been a while since they've eaten, they might be more inclined to go for a, a more direct attack too. Um. The thing is that the trauma that's caused in a community by the people, if there is an attack, by the people surrounding that, the people are rescued, and in both cases are rescuers, it's, it's huge, so we don't want to go through that again. We think because the bait fish normally aren't in this close and, and there are more sharks, there's, um, you know, I think we were sceptical, but, you know, we had four sharks at the weekend. Well, that's, that's not one shark, it's, you know, when you see three at a time and they're all whites, there's a reason they're there. Um, what that reason is, we think it's bait fish, we think it could be the river, um, but whatever it is, there are more sharks. Have you yourself ever had an issue where you've been a bit more frightened or seen something in the water that's maybe given you a bit of a scare? Yeah, I think a lot of people are really jumpy, but that's, you know, that's reasonable. You know, and if you see anything, everyone's like, what's that? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of bringing the surfers together a lot more, I feel, you know, because the surfing community's always been pretty tight around here, but. You know, there's all that fear in the air and everyone's sort of
kind of looking out for each other in a way. I don't know anyone who wants to go surfing by themselves these days. I mean, about two hours ago, we were watching just off, off the main beach bar, and there was just like bait fish just um, all along the beach, and the birds were just dive bombing the place, and there was heaps of dolphins. So there's probably a couple of uh, big grey men in suits down there too somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, if there's a shark, you know, cruising along the point, you wouldn't go out, but like the, a day later, I'd probably go out. And I think the media might overhype it a bit and go looking for sharks and um, sort of promote this fear factor of it. In terms of beach protection, um, they are looking at uh, things like electric fields. There are, there are cables with electrodes coming off them that can generate an electric field, and a shark has pores all over its body that detect the electric field it self produces and detects any distortion in that field from another living thing close by so that's how they can find prey in dirty water or buried in the sediment and so these cables produce an overstimulation of that like yelling in someone's ear or blinding light in their eyes it's an, an uncomfortable feeling and sharks have been shown to um, be repelled by it but yeah it, I think at the moment um, the uh, I think we're in a very good position here locally to put our hand up and say, look, if you want to try out some of these new technologies, try it here. Until the decision is made about what action to take based off the research and opinions from those in the community, surfers themselves will have to rely upon aerial and water patrols along with information shared through word of mouth to decide whether or not it's safe to go back in the water.